Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Use of Geospatial Technologies in Response to COVID, presented by the Arkansas GIS User Forum and the Center for Advanced Spatial Technologies. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Arkansas GIS Users Forum. I am your host, Chad. Joining me today on the panel is Dino Trawick, the chair of the Arkansas GIS Users Forum, Sharon Hawkins, chair of the Arkansas GIS Board, and GIS and Mapping Administrator at RDOT. Also, Brian Culpepper with CAST at the University of Arkansas. Daryl Allen, the GIS and Technology Coordinator with the City of Hope. And Paige Lott with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We would ask everyone who has a question to please feel free at any time to use the Q&A option at the bottom of their screen. You can enter those questions during the today's event and all of your questions will be answered live by our presenters at the end of the event. So it is my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Jack Cawthron, Director and Professor at the Department of Geosciences, University of Arkansas Center for Advanced Spatial Technologies and his associate Malcolm Williamson, also the Geospatial Applications and Education Manager at CAST. Malcolm, I will gladly turn things over to you, sir. Thank you. Okay, we are ready to uh, kick off. Uh, we're gonna be tag teaming this presentation. Uh, Jack's gonna be starting out, so I'll let him take the lead. Very good, Malcolm, uh, thank you. Um, so uh, today's the title of today's talk, as Chad said, is we're gonna be talking about mobility data and COVID-19 uh, responses and, and some ways that we can use it to uh, understand the spread of COVID a little better. Um, but we're going to start off with sort of a, a step back and looking at where the mobility data comes from. And you'll notice that we start with a black screen, sort of an ominous beginning. Uh, and we highlight one of the cleverest euphemisms, I think, in the technology and marketing community today, and that's mobility data because it connotes this free and unfettered movement of humans through space and time and this ennobling ability of us, of ours, to, to, uh, to measure all this movement and, and manage it. And it is that, but the data that it comes from is tracking data, tracking data from your cell phone uh, and the apps that you're using. And it's being provided often with your often passive consent unless you've actively taken steps to disallow its use, it's being tracked and managed by someone. We're going to explore that a little bit today uh, and then talk about some real examples of how it can be used in not only for uh, nefarious purposes a bit, but how it can be used for, um, to mitigate the spread, this pandemic spread that we're in. Malcolm, you can go to the next slide. So we're going to start by uh, reminding you of an article and talking about that, of, a, of, a, of a, an article that came out in the New York Times in December of 2019. Um, it um, talked about, um, it was a long, in-depth, several-part story on tracking data and how it's being used. And it was prompted by the delivery, um, clandestine delivery by someone who works in the industry of 50 billion location pings covering 12 million Americans over a period of several months in 2016 and 2017. Uh, the data was provided to the Times by sources who wanted to remain anonymous, anonymous because they weren't authorized to share it. The reason they gave for sharing it was because they were concerned that this data was out there and that many of the people who worked in those companies had full and unfettered access to it and that anyone at any time could release it just as they did. So the Times uh, did this story and focused on several cities in the US and looked at what they could find from this data. So uh, Malcolm, go to the next slide. And what you can see here is that uh, we can, in order to understand what's available to them, to these tracking companies, and we'll talk about who they are in a moment, uh, the data included more, this data include, uh, well, this is, this is 10,000 smartphones that were tracked in Central Park in New York City during that same time period. So you can see the pings throughout uh, Central Park, and this is 10,000 phones. Malcolm, go on to the next slide. If we isolate one of those phones um, in time, 
and then take that phone and look at its pings throughout its location pings throughout that several month period, you start seeing a pattern of that person's movements throughout that period. And of course they're time stamped and we all know how that can work so we can connect those. And if we add behind that, the building data that we all know and manage all the time, the road networks that, uh, that, that, we, that we are familiar with, if you put all that data in, you can create a diary of that person's movements. And here you see a heat map through that period. The thicker the line, the more often they traveled that route. So what the Times was able to get out of this because of the fact that routes ended at the, started at the beginning of the day, ended at the end of the day, they were able to find where people worked, where people lived. They identified a large number of individuals from the pure tracking data alone, no identifiers in it, but by tying it to the contextual data that we all know about well from our work, they were able to easily identify people who were deviating from their normal paths, perhaps being unfaithful to their spouse. They were able to identify secret service agents who visit, who were with uh, ex -president, or former President Trump uh, at one of his events. They were able to identify by name those secret service agents who were there and a large number of other things that they were able to identify just from this pure tracking data alone. So Malcolm, go on to the next slide. So fast forward to February 5th of this year, and the Times ran another, in this case, an opinion piece on data that was more data that was provided to the Times, perhaps by the same person, that tracked individuals who were at the, um, uh, at the Capitol on January 6th and at the rally on January 6th. Malcolm, go on to the next slide. They were able to track people from where they came uh, so they know exactly where they came from. Malcolm, going to the next slide. They were able to track movements during that day. And that's what you see here, movement from the National Mall um, in time over to the Capitol building. And they were able to do it with varying degrees of accuracy. And you have to give the Times credit here. They recognize the fact that not all location data is um, as accurate uh, is, is precise and that some pings are more accurate than others. And so in this particular case, they noted that for this particular person, they were unable to verify that they were actually in the Capitol um, during that day. Now, if you read this full article uh, from the Times, they identified this person. Uh, so there's a name associated with this. One of the things that they noted that in this data set that wasn't, uh, that was available in this data set that wasn't available in the December and the 2016 and 2017 data was this thing called the advertising ID, which all of our phones now have. If you have later than iOS 6, I think you have it in your cell phone, in your iPhone. And I'm not sure what version of Android started the tracking it, but it was an attempt to anonymize your phone, not giving them Mac addresses and uh, serial numbers for the phone, but instead giving them this ID but this ID is tied to all of your ads. So whether you're look, searching for things in Amazon or Facebook or what have you, it's all tied to that, uh, not that advertising ID. Um, so if you're interested, you can turn that off and you can also change it periodically so that it cuts off tracking for you. But that's another story for another time. So Malcolm, go on to the next slide. So who are these, these aggregators? Well, there are a variety of them. Um, there are ones that we're familiar with, the Googles of the world, uh, the Apple, um, others who collect the data from that system themselves, but that's not really the source of a lot of this data. Uh, there are other, um, mostly providers, uh, companies like the ones you see here who provide um, um, software development kits that other apps use to provide location services, to provide credentialing services, to provide a variety of things that they don't have to write. But in, a, in an agreement to use that SDK, the, these providers get access to all of your data. So um, all the tracking data that, uh, that they're allowed, that you allow them to give on your phone. So um, one of those companies is Enrix and they are a traffic uh, analytics um, company, provide that data to a variety of federal and state agencies uh, and, and, and to others. Another one that we're gonna look at that Malcolm's gonna walk you through in some detail is SafeGraph. And SafeGraph became uh, relatively uh, famous during the pandemic because they were providing some data 
at low cost or free in order to help track uh, uh, the spread. So Malcolm, go on to the next slide. So just as an example, I downloaded the NREX traffic app. Now this is a this is a routing app, just like Google or Apple provides. But I just wanted to bring to your attention the the opening screen. There is what we collect. Um, look at all that data they collect: the name, email address, username, GPS location, and search terms, uh, device model, cell provider, and signal strength, and so on to determine accuracy. I'm sure, and so on. You can also provide them with data, other data that you want. But if you don't agree to this, to this, then you don't get to use the, the data, now, or you don't get to use the app. Now that's intentional in some sense because this this company is focused on providing this app to mostly not consumers but to drivers and so on to get information. But it's there, and they provide location services to others that they use to collect and provide their analytics data. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention that that's out there. So the questions that we wanted to address today, I wonder how is this data being used and how can in particular for COVID-19 uh, tracking, um, is it being used well? And by well, I mean, not just effectively or efficiently, but ethically. And then we're gonna answer some of those questions really by looking at examples from SafeGraph, uh, from Terralytics, which is a Swiss company and from Google. So I think first up is Google, Malcolm, go on to the next slide. So this is an example that I think that, um, that struck me some time ago when I realized what was, what was happening or what might be happening. But uh, this is a, your Google Maps uh, that I looked at. I think this was back in October. And I just centered on the Home Depot here in Fayetteville. Uh, and you see all this information about the business that's provided by the business to Google so that you know, they can be identified and found, which is of course what they want. But if you scroll down a little bit, you can also get a histogram of popular times. So you can see when people are at the store on a particular day of the week, Thursday in this case, but also on a Saturday, which would have a different looking histogram because people are behave differently on the weekends than they do during the, during the work week. This was during the pandemic, so you, but you can see a spike from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, in, uh, in activity at that store. Well, where does that data come from? Well, that data comes from the tracking data that we saw earlier. They know when people are moving into the store and when they're in the parking lots and how they're moving out. And this is one of the ways that this data is, is made useful by, by aggregating it and anonymizing it in a way that you can't identify individuals like you can with the tracking data. So this, this, um, this way of distributing the data is really what's known as mobility data. What you get are these derived products that as GIS professionals, we are familiar, some of which we're familiar with. So that's one example of it. Malcolm, go on to the next. Now, that becomes important when you think about COVID-19. Uh, and um, as a precursor to Malcolm showing you some of the safe graph data that could lead to that Google result, I wanted to talk with you briefly about a paper that was published back in July of 2020 that tried to associate mobility patterns of people using this data and COVID-19 transmission in the US. So the data here is provided by Terralytics, which is, which is the Swiss company uh, that did this. And the, the data product that they provided in this particular case was a matrix showing travel patterns to and from counties. So uh, Malcolm, go on to the next slide. And they defined from that data a mobility ratio and essentially what they did was looked at um, how, many, uh, how, how many people were moving from one county to another county during a particular day of the week, and then how many people were moving from, well, from every county. So you can imagine a matrix of those counties and the cell values in, the, in that matrix were the number of people that moved from county I to county J during a particular day of the week, and then there would be seven of those matrices that had that information in them. So they aggregated that for 25 counties uh, scattered across the US. And you can see some of them, some of the states uh, there listed because there's a reason they're listed, but those, those, those curved lines are all about the counties, uh, county averages. And then computed what they called a mobility ratio. And so for January 6th through January 24th of 2020, they computed the average number of um, movements 
from each county to another county for each day of the week, and then uh, and then captured that as the baseline, averaged it out and captured it as the baseline. And then the rest of the data is how that mobility coefficient, the, the ratio between uh, from January 25th on through April 20th in this case, as a percentage of that baseline. So if it's above one, if the curve or the dot from that particular county is above one, there was more movement than, than in January. If it drops below that line, there's less movement. So what you're seeing here, what the numbers are telling you in terms of this, this data is that in fact, right before the, when, when we knew about the pandemic in China, when we knew that things were potentially getting bad in the first case, I think it was reported in late February in Washington state, there was a big increase in the number of people getting out. You see the hump on March 1st. We could theorize that that was people getting out to go to the grocery stores and to get stocked up. And then it plummeted the mobility ratio dropped. The vertical lines that you see tell when each of those states issued stay at home orders or directives. So well before California, say on March 19, issued the first of those orders, people were already going inside, right? And then it, it continued to drop and then rise again in April. Now we haven't, these, this group hasn't published this for, the, for any time past April 20, but this shows you an example of what you can pull out of this mobility data that we have. So Malcolm, go on to the next slide. Then what they looked at was to determine whether or not this mobility ratio could predict, not determine necessarily, but predict if there was a correlation between mobility uh, changes and the spread of the disease. So they defined a, the, the rate of growth of, of the disease spread. So they defined for each of these same counties using the John Hopkins aggregated or collected data they looked at for every week or every day of the week and every day throughout this period, the ratio of the three-day growth to the, pre, to the week's growth. So in other words, if it was increasing more than it had the previous few days or more than it had over the last week, that was a positive increase. So it was in, the rate of increase was going up, the rate of new cases was going up. If it was less than that, then the rate of change was going down, still adding cases, but the rate was smaller. And then they plotted it over as a lag distance. So they looked at the correlation between the mobility ratio and the COVID growth ratio for all of those days that you see there for 30 days, and then, and then pushed the mobility ratio, COVID, the growth ratio out seven, one day, two day, three days, four days, five days and found that after 11 days, they hit a peak of almost 80% correlation between those two numbers throughout all those counties, uh, throughout all that time period. And they could see that, um, so indeed it was correlated. That doesn't mean it's causal, but that it took about 11 days for a drop in mobility to relate to a drop in COVID growth. And then once it did, it stayed there. And so that period of nine to 12 days or so was pretty strong and in fact, it stayed that way throughout. So it was an interesting way of looking at the effects of those measures on COVID growth. It was an early attempt. There's a lot of problems with the study that the authors admit, but it was a really good attempt to show that. So Malcolm, go on the next slide. So at this point, that's sort of a general overview. And I, we, we, we read through this, saw this, and we wanted to see for ourselves exactly what this data looked like. And we were working with a group out of UAMS at the time, this was back in March of last year, working with the UAMS group to, to help understand what was going on in the state and try to uh, do what we could to help uh, with, with our response to that. And out of that effort grew this research activity that was part of a, of a larger group. So we'll talk, Malcolm's gonna talk a little bit about protecting anonymity and, and how uh, scaling the analysis um, with, with reporting by the county level works. The problems that we're having with something as geographers we're familiar with, the modifiable or real unit problem. And then to look at that as with some experience, uh, our experiences in Arkansas and Tennessee on a paper that will be coming out soon that was jointly authored by some people from UMS and Oak Ridge National Labs. And even Uber has some lessons to provide us in that respect. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Malcolm and uh, he's gonna take you into a deep dive, uh, deeper dive into um, mobility data. 
Hey, thanks, Jack. Um, first of all, uh, let's take a, a look at the basic way that we've been aggregating these, these case data uh, during this pandemic. It has been mostly to counties, right? We're all familiar with seeing maps like this. This allows us to have spatial and temporal comparison between different counties while protecting privacy of individuals, which has been a big concern, especially when the pandemic started out when we we're only having a handful of cases per the uh, uh, per population. Uh, and uh, anyway, so this map here, we're looking at uh, active cases per uh, 10,000 population by county, and this is back in August. And uh, like I said, most of you are probably familiar with what's, with what's called the modifiable aerial unit problem or MOP. Uh, and this basically says when you aggregate data to, to different scales of bins, it can provide you with different interpretations of what's really going on. So whether you're aggregating data to state or to counties like we are here or to tracks or block groups or census blocks, um, your interpretation may be different. And we definitely, found that to be true as we were doing research for this paper uh, with the COVID data. So let's start out simply by looking at population data here, uh, documented two different ways, looking at, we're looking at density aggregated by census block groups on the left and by census blocks on the right. And so he, with block groups, it sure looks like uh, here in Knox County, Tennessee, that the, the, the dense, the, you know, the highly, highly urban areas are kind of in the center of this particular county, uh, the rest of the county looks pretty rural. But if we break that down, aggregate it by blocks instead of block groups on the right-hand side, we now see that there are pretty dense areas you know, all around the county. They, not, they may not be that big, but they've got that high density. And when we're talking about you know, the, the contagiousness of, of, of COVID, we know that you know, the population density, how crowded we are, makes a difference. Uh, so this matters. Let's look a little closer to home, Washington County, Arkansas. Same situation. We've got a, a county that's got some, some fairly dense population centers and then the rest of the county is fairly rural. So if we look at the uh, population density by, um, oops, sorry about that. Uh, if we look at it by census block groups, we again miss out on these smaller areas over on the right-hand side, looking at blocks, we can see we're missing out this uh, area down in West Fork and Prairie Grove and, and, uh, and Lincoln. And we even say, you know, there's a little bit higher density down in that Southern part of the county where, you know, we see nothing over on the left. Um, so let's look at the specific example here uh, of the COVID uh, case map again. So this is the same map we were looking at a second ago, the active cases per, 10,000 population, and this is on August 17th. And since I'm from uh, Washington County, let's take a look up there. And we can see that according to this map, we've got uh, three to 20 cases per 10,000 population up there. Okay. Now, let's see what happens. If we look at data from the Arkansas Center for Health Improvement, they shared data that's broken down by, this aggregated by zip codes. And so in that same area there, I see that my zip code 72701 is actually quite low, less than 10 cases. That's probably less than that. They're not showing numbers smaller than that in this data. Whereas up in Springdale in the same county here, this is at that point in time, that's where the high density of cases is. And so when you aggregate it by the county, we're losing that specificity, that specific, specificity. <laughs> can't talk. Um, okay, um, Uber has uh, come up with a mechanism to try, to try to overcome a little bit of the uh, of this problem using what's called H3, their hexagonal hierarchical spatial index. And so this uh, has the advantages of having equidistance cells, which is very useful for looking at movement and, and especially if distance is, I mean, if, sorry, if direction is important. Um, and the bins that they're using are all gonna be these same size uh, hexagons. Uh, it's indexed for efficient operations and this allows Uber to get easier and faster analysis than using simply 
you know, point locations, and they don't have to worry about using other uh, bins that are of arbitrary or differing sizes, like, like census blocks and block groups and tracks and things like that. Um, I also have to uh, throw a little note out here. Those of you, you that know Fred Limp uh, at CAST, um, his dissertation back in the 70s also used hexagonal uh, analysis of, uh, it was an archeological spatial analysis and he chose hexagons for the same reason that Uber's doing it here. Uh, again, equidistant cells um, and uh, you know, he argued that it was a, a good basis for GIS but in the 70s it was a little rough for making an automated system using that. Okay, now let's move on and take a look at the Google mobility data. They shared some of their data uh, specifically for uh, mobility analysis during the pandemic. Uh, and they, it was aggregated by counties, but they made it available. They classified it based upon the types of activities. But this is related to the, you know, the same mobility data that they're using to show you know, when, the, uh, when stores are busy or things like that. And so let's take a look at some of this. And so here we're looking at grocery and pharmacy uh, uh, business uh, trips to those. And we're looking at the change from baseline numbers. So as we go towards purple, we're increasing a chain, you know, more change from baseline, brown is less. And so on the bottom, we can see this is February 14th, 2020. So this is before, you know, here in Arkansas, the, the, the bad magic date is March 11th, right? That's our first case in Arkansas. So here's the 21st and it looks like, you know, People are going about their business. A few areas are, are you know, more trips, other ones are less. And then suddenly on the 28th, we start to get concerned. Suddenly we realize something, you know, things are going on, we better stock up. And so everybody is going to the grocery store and the pharmacy and stocking up. And then on the 6th, we still have the same activity going on and the 13th and then people start to get nervous because we now know that it, that it's been found identified in arkansas and so people are starting to lock down and by the time we hit march 27th everybody is staying home and then as we start moving further ahead i jumped forward to april 3rd and you can see that in some of the more rural counties um, where they haven't been that many cases reported yet, people are starting to get out and about again, whereas in the uh, you know, Little Rock and Northwest Arkansas and Paragould and the larger population areas, people are still uh, a little nervous about getting out. Now let's take a look at parks. So activity at parks. Now this data doesn't have as much, um, there aren't as many counties in the state of state. I think uh, you know, how they identify parks um, you know, you, we've certainly got parks in all the counties, but they may not be the ones that they're using. So back in February, uh, this is Valentine's Day, right? Um, we've got folks visiting parks. Um, a week, two weeks later, February 28th, uh, probably the weather was a little nicer, so more people getting out. And then March 13th, everybody's staying home again. And um, so probably a good idea. And by the time we get up to the, you know, a couple of weeks later, we see that some people are going, well, it's probably not so bad to get out as long as we're staying away from people. So parks may be a good place to go. And as time progresses, here's the 24th, more and more people are getting out. And by the time we get into May, people are realizing, yeah, if we need to be away from people, but we're tired of being cooped up, let's go to the parks. And even as we fast forward to July, we're seeing that there's a lot of activity in parks, as we all know. And this is actually September. Okay, now I'm gonna switch over and take a little uh, closer look at the safe graph data. And um, we purchased some of these data. Uh, this is for one month, it's for September 2020. And we purchased what's called the core and the pattern data for full service restaurants, limited service restaurants, and drinking establishments. And these data tell us where and when people came from that went to these places, how long did they stay at these locations and perhaps more as well. 
So here, simple map showing the, the set of data we purchased. And this is, a, I think it's about $200 right here is if it was paid for, they gave us a free voucher for some of this data, these data. So we've got blue with limited service restaurants, green are the full service restaurants and uh, dark red are the drinking places. And I'm zooming in here to Martin Luther King Drive and Fayetteville and you can see the, you know, we've got a lot of data here. We've got, uh, you know, we've got Chicken Row, Zaxby's and Slim Chickens and Raisin Cane's and we've got some full service restaurants and we've got a couple bars in here. Now, we can look at the median dwell time at each of these locations. So now we've jumped up into Springdale. Uh, that's 412 right down the middle there. And we're looking at limited services, limited services restaurants. So fast food mostly. And we can see that most of these places must be getting drive through pick up customers because the dwell time at many is less than 15 minutes or less than 30 minutes. There's a couple out there that, that are, you know, greater than 60 or 120 minutes. But for the most part, people are getting their food and getting out of there. So let's compare that to the full service restaurants, the same location. And you can see we've definitely increased the dwell time at these restaurants, people spending more time there. Uh, let's zoom in so we can see a little better. I'm gonna zoom into downtown Springdale. And so not as many um, fast food locations here. We've got some, some full service restaurants that still have very low median dwell times, less than 15 minutes on several of these. And so that tells me that they're probably doing, um, you know, curbside or pickup only, you know, no inside, no indoor dining. Again, this is for September. So they had kind of opened things back up after being shut down for a while as far as dining and restaurants go. And then finally, compare that all to the drinking places. And sure enough, as you might expect, people are spending much more time at these locations. Um, so another piece of data that we can look at is where are the people coming from? So if we're concerned about, you know, transmission in a pandemic is, you know, we want to know, you know, what's the mobility, where are people coming from to these locations? So back on Martin Luther King in Fayetteville, let's pick on Slim Chickens here and let's see which census tracks the customers are coming from. Holy cow. So I've got folks from Fort Smith and beyond. I've got folks from Harrison. Um, looks like a large area. Um, okay, so let's take a look. This is the actual table showing those selected records and over on the right side, we can see how many trips originated from each one of these tracks. We can also see related same day and same month uh, brands. So people that went to Slim Chickens also went to Walmart and Harps and Sonic. Um, and finally, uh, this is the same type of, da type of data that uh, Jack was showing us in Google Maps where we show popularity by hour and also popularity by day. So let's take a look at a more rural area. So this is Huntsville, Arkansas. If you're familiar with 412 passing through Huntsville on the bypass, uh, there's a Taco Bell and a McDonald's. Let's take a look at that McDonald's there. This is kind of you know out of the way, but it's on a main highway. So what does that mean? It again means we've got customers coming from all around talking south of Fort Smith, out by Russellville, way up into Missouri. I actually don't have data too far over into Oklahoma, so it probably went even further than what you see here, but you get the idea. Um, well, let's try something a little more obscure. So same town, Huntsville, let's go downtown. Let's choose something local. How about Granny's Kitchen? And this one here, we can see we are indeed getting local customers. So it depends upon, you know, it depends upon the uh, access to these restaurants and the type of restaurant it is, not only where it is. Um, and uh, finally, let's look at uh, Bentonville and let's look at a full service restaurant here. I see there's a Lucy's Diner right in the middle and let's see what's going on here. So Bentonville, Walmart, this is a hub. We've got folks coming from way over in Oklahoma, Tahlequah, south of Fort Smith, um, 
way up there in Missouri. So again, this is an area that's, that's getting people from all over. Uh, probably not a great thing if you're trying to uh, limit spread. So Jack, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to, uh, to wrap up this. Okay, uh, thanks Malcolm. So um, just a few takeaways from the talk, you know, I think that uh, clearly uh, we, and I think this is not news to anyone, but tracking data is collected from all of our smartphones. Um, what perhaps is new maybe in some ways is that it is aggregated and sold by many companies as mobility data and that that mobility data has a lot of valuable uses. It's clear, I think what we showed today is that in tracking, uh, I, I, I imagine that a lot of this has been used, if not to understand, it, it, to understand retrospectively what's happening and what policies have strong effects in terms of spread, um, that, that it's available for that. It's obviously very valuable. As Malcolm pointed out, we spent or would have spent $200 at SafeGraph just for the data for today's talk, one month in a very defined small area. If you were to do this across a very large area over a long period of time, you're talking about a serious investment in that resource and one that would have to pay off for your company, I think, uh, you know, soon. Um, but um, we, you know, as GIS professionals, we've become, we've come use, become used to uh, the uh, using and distributing data provided by government agencies and perhaps large businesses, um, whether it's federal or state or the local level, that's the kind of data we're used to seeing, public data. But this kind of data is new. Uh, it's not only big, but it, it, it's unrivaled in its terms of its high resolution in space and time. Uh, and what it can provide uh, information, information on, both for good and for bad, and that we need to be aware of that, uh, that balance. Um, and, and also be aware that privacy restrictions, people are getting wise to this, and so privacy restrictions are already, I think, having an impact on the avail availability of mobility data. And so you can take as an example that iOS 14, when it came out, um, it had a variety of new location options Interestingly enough, one that allows you to change the degree of accuracy with which your position is reported so that you can report your position to some levels of accuracy for certain applications like, like um, routing applications and far less accurate position for other apps um, for tracking you. Uh, so depending on what it is that you're, perhaps it's a store, often stores or companies will ask you where you are so they know which store to tell you to is closest to you. You can limit that now in iOS 14, and I'm sure Android has a similar function as well. And then, of course, both in Europe and California, new restrictions on, on, the, on the ability for these companies to use your personal data will have an effect on this. But, um, but it is a data source that we want to be careful not to um, um, let, go, let get by without um, us making use of it for good, because there are some valuable there's a lot of valuable information in it, as long as we, from a policy perspective, treat it uh, in the right way. And I think this is the larger question within um, uh, the, the technology community, of course. And there's been a lot of debate about that over the last few weeks and months, uh, and it will continue, I think, and it needs to continue. So uh, that's um, the bulk of the, that's the presentation, and uh, we're available to answer any questions that you might have. So thanks, Malcolm. Excellent. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Malcolm. So we would like to now open everything up for questions. Uh, let's see here. I think it uh, is testimony when a presentation is so well informed that there's no questions <laughs> left to ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just, I, I'll say this, I think probably a lot of you, I think there are probably a lot of you out in the audience um, who have had perhaps even more experience with this kind of data and, um, and have your own thoughts and opinions. I think you know, that, that would be interesting to hear if that's even possible, Chad, in this arrangement. Um, but I know that it's uh, something that's used by a lot of um, local governments uh, as well, or, or local and state governments. 
Yeah, uh, absolutely. That is an option. In fact, uh, anyone that is online as a panelist, uh, there is another option you'll notice down at the bottom of your screen for raise hand uh, so that if anyone has some information they would like to share, uh, we can actually uh, add you in as a, a panelist to share that information with, with everyone who's online today, uh, if anyone would be so brave. <laughs> There are a couple of questions, Chad, in the uh, chat area. Ah. Or a question and a comment, anyway. Yep, so looks like first question is, will we have a follow-up on how to stop this on our phones? Uh, I'm assuming that means uh, the sharing of that location voluntarily or involuntarily? Yeah, yeah, not in this presentation, but, uh, but I would... Um, if you Google it, it'll track that you're Googling it, but, but Google, uh, uh, um, duck, duck, go. No, yeah, you can use duck, duck, go. Uh, <laughs> advertising ID is one phrase you should use and simply, and then there's, a, I know there's a wired article that I read not too long ago that gave a walkthrough on iOS and on Android, how to disable tracking. So in, and in, in, I'm, I'm, I'm an iPhone user, so I know in iOS it's called, um, LAT or limit um, available tracking or limit something tracking, uh, but it's available in the settings and you can determine how you use it, but you might want to consider looking at the advertising ID as well as the tracking and location data use. And so you can, uh, I can find some links, Chad, and we can post them later. I don't, I can't probably right now, but uh, uh, but find those and, and send those out. But I think that's a common thing now, and you should probably be able to find it in, in the common literature on how to do it. I know Apple provides detailed instructions on how to do it. Right, and, and Jack, wasn't a, in, in that original Times article, wasn't a big part of it the discussion about third-party apps that were using tracking data that you well, might not think are using tracking data? Right, so what, when you turn that on, when you, when you turned off your location access, and, and iOS again, and I assume it's the same in Android, you can turn it off for every app on your phone. In other words, in Apple's iOS will not allow any application to access that under any circumstances, or you can provide it uh, specifically to certain apps and not to others. So you can determine which ones are able to use it. So if you're going to use a, a mapping, you know, a routing application, either Apple Maps or Google Maps, Clearly, they have to have your tracking. They have to be able to use that your data, right? But if you don't want Facebook, or if you don't want Amazon Prime, or any of a number of other application, any application really, to use it, you can specifically tell the iOS not to allow that application to use it. And that is where the source of this comes from. So it's not necessarily from Apple and Google, though they obviously do provide it. But it also comes from these other aggregators who not only provide tracking data, but combine it as Google did with a variety of other sources uh, like e establishments, business establishments where you are and things to create more valuable data. So it's a, you know, as GIS professionals, we do this all the time, right? It's just that now we're using very personal data and data that is really impossible to anonymize in its raw form. You just, you just can't do it if you know what you're doing and it doesn't even take that much skill to do it. Excellent. So to, uh, to perhaps put an even more relevant spin on this, if I could uh, pose on one of our panelists today, Miss Miss Sharon Hawkins, uh, would you be available perhaps to contribute just for a minute on the use of a very relevant site and, and tool, iDrive Arkansas? Yeah. Chad, can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Great. So, uh, so for everybody that wants to turn off their locations, if you're using uh, any kind of traffic on your digital device, such as uh, iDrive Arkansas uses Google traffic. So you're just not allowed to look at the traffic if you're not gonna allow us to track you because we gotta know where you are. Uh, anyway, so, so Chad, uh, in, in all seriousness, uh, so, so iDrive Arkansas uses the Google traffic or Google API, so we get the Google background map. We use the Google traffic uh, for iDrive Arkansas for that live traffic um, underneath that 
uh, that stoplight there at the top where you can turn on Google traffic. Um, and, and for winter weather, while we're looking at our, our road conditions that our districts are putting in, um, we're seeing where traffic is slowed down. We can see where there might be an issue. Maybe we need to send a plow truck out there. So it's a wonderful information coming in from, from everybody's location while they're driving around the roads. Great, thank you, Sharon. Yeah, I, I knew this was, uh, just from my own personal experience, uh, a very, very positive use of mobility data that we're definitely all benefiting from today and from your phenomenal leadership at RDOT. So thank you very much for everything that you do. So it looks like another question uh, posed in the chat. Uh, do you see the use of hex bins for data aggregation growing in its use? Uh, I see that ArcGIS Online has offered hex bins for data display in, since 2015. Um, I'll, I'll start on that, Malcolm. I, yes, I, I think that it is growing. And, I, and as an example of that, I haven't tracked it, but Uber, the, 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 the H3 product or the H3 aggregation that we talked about briefly, is available in Git, GitHub. You can download the entire implementation and the tools to use it. And I have a feeling that other, uh, you know, that other uh, similar location-based companies or location-based tracking companies are using it in a similar way. And so, yeah, I do expect to see it um, to grow as the tools are made available to people. So ArcGIS made it available. And I think it's, if you look at a lot of their map books that are coming out, a lot of the analysis that's done now is at the, is at, instead of at a raster level or square raster level, it is at this hex level. And it's also available in, in statistical tools like R and uh, Python has its own you know, way to do this. So it is growing, I think. And as the understanding of how it can be used effectively uh, grows, it will also, you'll see more use of it. I would think one limitation uh, when comparing it to raster data is the fact that we've got all these sensors out there right now that are all raster based, you know, all the cameras and, and multispectral sensors and things like that, that are, you know, rectangular by, by default. And so, you know, that's going to tend to not encourage hexagonal analysis of their data directly. Um, I see it more used for aggregating point type data. What do you think, Jack? Yes, absolutely. Point type data. I don't see the. I don't see, for example, the Census Bureau going to the bureau. You know, using this because um, it is. Uh, 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 it's not suited for the kind of human activity that that we're used to. Uh, so I wouldn't see the Census Bureau, you know, confining their data to something like this. Uh, and they obviously choose their the size of their tracks uh, in a way that uh, that anonymizes data. So there are limit, as Malcolm pointed out, there are other limitations as well. So, um, but it but it can be used for point data, I think, and as as especially this kind of point data that we're talking about here. And I just I wanted to point out so, so Sharon's exactly right. There are there are many applications that rely on your location data on, and and required to be tracked. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I didn't mean to imply that. The, in fact, on my phone, I allow a lot of apps to use my location, uh, especially ones that aren't advertising things to me because I really don't <laughs> want to see all that or that aren't trying to sell me something. You know? so, but I do allow for iDrive. I do allow, and which I've used a lot, I do allow for a variety of other apps out there. So it's a, it's a, I guess the point is, is that it's a, it, it can be fine-tuned to the things that you want in a way that can help protect your privacy. And um, it's not to say that everyone is doing things that need to be private. You just never know what, um, you know, what your, where humans are pretty ingenious and can do a lot of things with data. So you just have to be aware that it's out there and then you can make your own decision about it. Right. There's also um, a whole lot of people throwing a whole lot of money at the cracking the nut of indoor tracking, indoor mobility tracking um, and that will be something else to become aware of, but that's got a, you know, an awful lot of value uh, in advertising, you know, going into a store and getting dinged when you get close to a particular aisle. It's got a product that they think you might be interested in. And so, you know, it's got real convenience 
factors as well as, you know, also, you know, marketing value. So, you know, how do you decide, you know, do you want, do you want to play that game? Is that, does it have value to you? Do you want to give up that information in order to, you know, have those benefits? And that's going to become just I think, more and more prevalent as we move forward. Excellent. So I think it, we may have exhausted all of our questions for today. So I would like to go ahead and conclude and, and thank our speakers today, Dr. Jack Cawthron and Malcolm Williamson, for an absolutely phenomenal presentation. Uh, for everyone on today, if you have any ideas for a presentation moving forward and you would like to contribute, please go online to our website, argisusers.org slash webinar and click the call for presentations link where you can submit your presentation uh, for review. So at this time, we'll end today's webinar. Thanks everyone again for attending. We look forward to seeing you next month on March 17th for our next installment of the Arkansas GIS Users Forum Educational Webinar Series. Thanks so much and have a great day.